Well, as you're seating, opening your Bibles to James 2, I was reminded of the story of a church in a very, very wealthy part of town. Very upscale church, a lot of wealthy people there. And one day, a woman who was clearly from the other side of the tracks came to the pastor in his office and said that she wanted to become a member. He looked at her and said, well, ma'am, why don't you go home for a week and think about it? So she went home for a week and she came back the next week. She says, Pastor, I'm back and I want to become a member. He said, well, why don't you go home and read your Bible for a week and then let me know if you still want to be a member. So she didn't want to do it, but she went home, read her Bible for a week, came back and said, Pastor, I, I still want to be a member. He says, okay, you got to do one more thing for me. Go home and pray for an entire week every single day and ask the Lord if he wants you to be a member here. She didn't come back. About six months later, he was walking down the street and saw her, and he went over and he says, hey, I've been wondering uh, what what happened. Uh, You know, you're going to pray and let me know. And she says, well, I was in prayer every day, every day, every day. And finally, one day, the Lord said to me, honey, don't worry about it. I've been trying to get in that church for 20 years. And I thought, oh, how sad that that would be the description of the church of Jesus Christ. What a sad thing that we've allowed things to come in that would keep us from experiencing the supernatural unity bought by the blood of Christ. And I think about that right now because our nation is obviously in turmoil and people desperately want something that looks like unity. They're tired of partiality. They're tired of prejudice. They're tired of being treated differently based on externals. And the reactions are extreme. And in the midst of that, the church ought to be a shining light. We ought to be the ones saying, we have the answer. Come in here and experience what true unity looks like. That's what ought to be happening. Because the church is the called out ones, the ecclesia. We are called out of the world to be different. We're supposed to be transformed from the inside out. We're supposed to live in such a way that people see Christ in us. There should be a love, a unity across ethnic, linguistic, socioeconomic, educational, geographical, and even, yes, political boundaries. The church ought to be the place where people can come together in love and unity and learn and grow and become more like Jesus together. That's heavenly wisdom. But unfortunately, there's a lot of earthly wisdom that still has an ugly place in the church. Last week, it was Father's Day, and we took a moment to look at the goodness and the glory of God from Exodus 34. And I hope that was encouraging to you in these difficult times where it seems like everybody's being accused of being evil and wicked and nasty, to be able to study a God who describes himself as gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and in truth, yet he's still holy and just. He still addresses sin and calls it sin. He still brings the wicked to justice. That's the God we serve. And he wants us to be like him. And in this particular area we're going to look at today in the book of James, it's critical that we be like our Heavenly Father because it is so easy to be like the world and to judge based on externals. So I don't know about you, but I want his character on display in my life. I don't want people to see me. I want them to see Jesus. To feel his love when they come into contact with me. I want the character of Christ on display in our church and in the way we fellowship. So by way of quick review, the book of James is all about wisdom. It's heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom. The peak of the book is in the middle of it. The the book kind of builds to a crescendo in the middle where in chapter 3, at the end of the chapter, he highlights the fact that heavenly wisdom is actually seen in godly behavior. It's not worldly wisdom. It's not just up in your head. It flows out of your life. And then that wisdom ultimately is demonstrated in chapter 4 when you choose not to be a friend of the world but to be a friend of God, to walk in lockstep with him, to walk in his ways, to demonstrate his character. And everything else in the book is living that out. 
Every other passage is highlighting God's wisdom that we might embrace fully and live out in our lives day to day, and especially when we gather together. So we were looking at that. We saw the introduction of the book. We're supposed to be joyful in trials. The book breaks down into sections based on a, a, it's called a nominative. It's a greeting. Usually it's my brethren, and then followed by a command. And so the first one was be joyful in trials. The second one, stop being misled. The third one, respond properly to the word of God. And now we come to another one. And this one is uh, really, really a tough one because this one is stop the sin of partiality. Now, when someone says stop something, what's the implication? It's it's happening. And James is writing to brethren. He's writing to Christians. And he's saying, stop it. Don't let this be in the church anymore. I want to read the whole passage for you, verses 1 through 13. We're only going to get the first four verses today, and then we'll look at the rest of it next time. But in verses 1 through 13, he says, My brethren... Stop holding your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a man in in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one in the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the other man, you stand over there or sit by my footstool. Wow, can you imagine that? What a horrific picture. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, it's another command. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you're fulfilling that, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing what? Sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. And I love this last part. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. However, mercy, what? Triumphs over judgment. This whole passage keeps bringing us back to the scripture, the wisdom of God, to seeing things from God's perspective, not the way we're so prone to see it. And this section is regarding the sin of partiality or personal favoritism. And James knows it's going on in the church and he wants it to stop. So he begins in verses 1 through 4 with the reproof. This is what. He's describing what the problem really is and going into detail about it. And then he's going to come back with the reasons why it must stop. And the reasons are unbelievably compelling. We'll get to those next time. So let's look today at the reproof in verses 1 through 4. Now, James calls them to repent. And this is what pastors should do to their churches, right? We we don't just repent at the moment of salvation. Repentance should be an ongoing thing that happens every day of our life. I don't know about you, but I've never made it through one day without sinning. I just haven't. Whether it's been in my thoughts, my attitudes, my words, or my actions, every single day I fall short of the glory of God. And God wants me to repent. He wants me to turn from it. He wants me to stop it, turn from it, confess it, and then go another direction. And this is critical for the church to be the church in a world that's desperate for answers. So he says here, there's three different elements of this reproof. There's an exhortation, an illustration, and the application. So the exhortation's in verse one. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. And literally, this is a very, very difficult verse to translate. The Greek language literally says, My brethren, not in personal favoritism, hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ of the glory. It's tough to put that into English. That's why so many translations take it a little bit differently. But he starts off with my brethren. And again, he's talking to believers 
My brethren, my family, my beloved folks, the, we've all been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. We've all been redeemed by his blood. We're in his eternal family. My brethren, and then he has the command, do not hold. Do not hold your faith this way. You say, this is a new section. Yes, it is, but it ties in with the last one. I want you to look at something fascinating because at the end of chapter 1 in verse 26, he says something here that becomes somewhat of an outline for the rest of the book. He says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We looked at that two weeks ago. Wicked, worthless religion is what most people in the world experience. The vast majority of people in the world are, are religious, and most of them are in a false religion. It's a worthless religion. And you can tell because their tongue has never been tamed. Why hasn't the tongue been tamed? Because the heart hasn't been transformed. So we looked at that. But the true religion is demonstrated by three things. You have a tongue that's under control. You have a controlled tongue. You have a compassionate heart for orphans and widows, and you have a clean life. You walk in purity as Jesus is pure and holy. And when you see that three-part outline of what real religion looks like, you then look at the next few chapters. Chapter 2 highlights and expands the idea of the compassionate heart. Chapter 3 highlights and expands the idea of a controlled tongue. And chapter 4 and following highlights the idea of a clean life. So you see those three things in greater detail after those summary statements at the end of chapter 1. So this is a new section, but it ties back into this idea of the compassionate heart. And so James gives a clear command. Do not... Hold your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ while at the same time having an attitude of personal favoritism. Do not hold or have. Now some have said, well, that Greek word there could be translated as either an imperative or an indicative, and it may not be a command, but virtually anybody, most conservative scholars believe that it really should be taken as a command. And with the negative word before that, it's stop doing it. Stop holding on to your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now see how real their faith is. These people would say, Jesus Christ is our Lord and he's glorious. He is the resurrected king. He's God in human flesh. He's the coming savior. Their theology is right. They believe the right things. They just don't practice the implications. And that's the tension we all experience. They have a faith in him. But sanctification is a long process, isn't it? How many of you have arrived at perfect holiness? Anybody? It's a long road, isn't it? Difficult road. I, I think somewhat of like Randy's recuperation from this surgery. They said it could take four or five months. Boy, the sanctification process is way longer than that. And we need to be patient with each other. We need to help each other, come alongside each other, pray for one another, encourage one another in these sayings. And so James, as a true pastor, com comes alongside, but first he has to say, stop it. You folks have got to stop this. This should never be true inside the church. It is, but it shouldn't be. I know you're trying to follow Jesus. You're holding on to a faith in him but you're also hanging on to worldly wisdom at the same time. You want both, and you can't have both. See, worldly wisdom treats people differently based on externals. God doesn't see it that way. God wants us to look at people differently. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world, right? But they're acting like they want to be in heaven, but not of heaven. Hey, I'm on my way to heaven. I just don't want to act like I'm a heavenly citizen. I want to go to heaven but live like the world. And James says, it's got to stop. I love you too much to let you keep doing this, so I'm going to rebuke you for it. What is this personal favoritism or partiality he, he, he translated in verse 9? Same word. It's an interesting Greek word. It's a combination word, a compound word of two different Greek words. One of the words means to receive, and the other word means face. So what he's saying is, you receive people based on externals. 
That's how you judge. That's how you determine how you're going to treat people. And this is just flat out wrong. It's evil. It's wicked. It's a horrible idea. We don't know exactly where uh, this word comes from, from the Old Testament, because it doesn't appear in the Septuagint. There's nowhere in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament that this Greek word is ever used. In fact, it wasn't even used in secular Greek. Many people believe that Christians invented this word. Imagine that. They were looking at the world around them and the way people were treating each other in the marketplace, and they said, let's not be that. The apostles possibly created this word. Some think it was an effort to match up to another Hebrew concept in the Old Testament, which was the expression to lift up the face or be partial. That Hebrew word, which wasn't translated that in the the Septuagint, with the same Greek word we're looking at, but in Leviticus 19.15 says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. Don't be partial. Psalm 82.2, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? This is what was going on in the court system in Israel. They were actually having judges taking bribes, catering to the rich, looking to get something out of it, and he says, it's just got to stop. When a judge is partial, they raise the face of one person unjustly and put down the face of another person unjustly. That's the concept here. James Hebert, a great commentator, one of the best commentaries on James, says this, This word always denotes favoritism or partiality, a biased judgment based on external circumstances such as race, wealth, social rank, or popularity, while disregarding the individual's intrinsic merit. Now get this picture. They have intrinsic worth. Why? Because all people are created in the image of God. Everyone is created in the image of God, therefore there is an intrinsic worth. You are a human being. You are distinct of everything else God created. You are his highest creation. You matter. You know that but there's still a tendency to treat people different based on external circumstances. And James says it's got to stop. See, a compassionate heart can't be one that operates on the basis of personal favoritism. It can't. It's incongruent, by the way, with our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's why Paul uses that phrase. Imagine our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, which, by the way, is a great statement for the brother of Jesus to say, isn't it? The one who did not believe in Jesus until after Jesus rose from the dead. That brother who thought, my older brother's a lunatic, that brother comes to profess to the whole world, my half-brother is God in human flesh. He's the glorious Lord. He's sitting on the throne above, and he's going to come back glorious once again. How do you match that truth and then take two people that that glorious Lord has saved and treat them differently? One favorably and one disfavorably. It doesn't make any sense. He's the Lord of glory. He's the one who condescended in Philippians 2. He's the one who came down and didn't just come down to our level. That Philippians 2 describes he became our slave. He came to suffer and die to meet our needs. What condescension is that? And you can't lower yourself down to the point that you can treat everybody equally? That's a problem. And he's coming in glory soon. Imagine this. When Jesus Christ comes in glory, what's his kingdom going to be like? Will there be prejudice in the kingdom of God? Don't you read the book of Revelation in chapter 5 and chapter 7 where it describes that every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue are going to be there? There's going to be people from all over the world that have been saved in the testimony of the church and the testimony of the angel in the mid-heavens and the testimony of the 144,000. People all over the world are going to get saved and be in that kingdom worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to be treated equally. Absolute justice. That's what our world's looking for. Do you know that God never shows partiality? Ever? In fact, it says that in Deuteronomy 10, 17, and 18. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. 
Matthew twenty two sixteen. 16, when the Pharisees were wanting to trap Jesus, they come up to him and they said to him, teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to any. Even his enemies had to admit he was impartial. Romans 2.11, there is no partiality with God. Ephesians 6.9, there is no partiality with him. Colossians 3.25, we're all going to be judged without partiality. 1 Peter 1.17, if you address as father the one who impartially judges, then live like it. This is a big issue. This is all over the Bible. There's no way to miss this biblically. God says, Partiality is a sin. It's evil. To take people at face value, to judge the book by its cover, is absolutely wicked. And yet it goes on day after day after day. This is uncomfortable. John 7, 24, Jesus said, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Friends, it doesn't make sense to hold on to my glorious Lord Jesus and practice partiality at the same time. Did any of us get chosen because we merited it? Was election based on we deserved something? No. It's the grace of God. There's a paraphrase I came across. Don't ever attempt to combine snobbery with faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good summary of what he's trying to say. Stop being snobs. Stop saying that some people are better than others. But let's take a minute, what is James not saying? Because again, what we're seeing in our culture, the pendulum is swinging way too far one way or the other. We need to stay with our anchor on the truth. We need to stay right here on what is true. People have gone this way and that way, let's stay with the truth. What is he not saying? Well, he's not saying you can't intellectually recognize that people are different. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are taller than others. Some people are wealthier than others. Some people are more educated than others. Those are observations. Those are realities. He's not saying you can't recognize that. Some people have greater skills and abilities in certain areas than others. That's why the church, when it comes together, we're not all an eye, we're not all an ear, we're not all an elbow. We're different parts, and we should function accordingly. So you, you can recognize that, and you can respect that. That's perfectly fine. He's also saying that, uh, you, you, he's not saying you always treat everyone exactly the same way. See, that doesn't make any sense. You can't do that. And that would violate other commands. For example, my first priority with my finances after I give to the Lord is to take care of my family, my physical family. First Timothy 5 talks about that. If I don't do that the right way, I'm, I'm worse than an infidel. So I've got to take care of my family and even my extended family, which includes widows and others. I need to take care of my family. But then Galatians 6 also says that if you're going to do good to all men, especially the household of God. So my first priority is my own family. My second priority is the church family. And whatever I have left after that, I can minister and give as much as I possibly can to those outside the church. Does that make sense? That's not saying that I'm treating them based on, on their face. I'm just following biblical guidelines on what I should do with my resources. He's also not saying that you can't honor specific people at specific times. For example, if someone has a position of authority over you, it's perfectly okay for you to acknowledge that. You know, like you know, when your wife walks in, say, all hail the queen, you, whatever it is. You can, you can treat the people the way they ought to be treated or vice versa. You have a boss, you treat them differently because they, they, they're in that place of honor and respect, they deserve that. For example, if the President of the United States came to our church service, and I wish he would, and if he came in here, it would be perfectly okay to give him a, a secure place to sit uh, with security around him, etc., because of who he is. Does that make sense? This is not partiality. This is just honoring, like the Bible says, honor the king, or in our case, the president. That's perfectly fine to do that. He's not talking about those things. He's not talking about not honoring your parents because we're commanded to honor our parents, honor others in authority. It's, it's okay for you to give up your seat for an elderly person on a bus, right? Because Leviticus 19 tells us to do things like that. So we have this reality that we can celebrate at specific times, specific people without violating this command. Well, then what is he saying? He's saying you can't practice the sin of partiality. 
And he calls it that in verse 9. Now there's two separate extremes here because partiality goes two ways. You take people based on externals and you either, one, treat the one person favorably because of what you see, or you treat them with contempt because of what you see. You lift one up, you put the other down. That's what he's talking about. That's what this sin is. And there's countless ways it's practiced. How do you know there's countless ways? Because he says it literally in plural, personal favoritisms. There's not just one. There's many. There's so many different ways we could practice personal favoritism. There are so many ways. Literally, someone said it should be translated the acts of personal favoritism. What are some ways we treat people favorably? Well, we do so on the basis of wealth. We'll get to that. Clothing, the school they attended, their appearance. They're either beautiful or they're not. Their position, their title, their ethnicity, their age, their gender, their skills, the neighborhood they live in, the house they own, the political party they're affiliated with. We look at all of those externals and go, okay, I will elevate you. We practice this by receiving bribes, forming cliques, saying flattery saying things you don't even know to be true to somebody who you think you might get something from, name dropping, all of that as if that person's better. We can show contempt by harming people physically, verbally, or emotionally, making jokes about them or ridiculing them, overgeneralizing certain groups of people, snubbing people and not associating with them, avoiding them, ruling unjustly. Those are all different ways. You say, well, I, I, I've never physically done any of that, but he's talking about doing it even in your mind. It's a sin. That's where it starts. It's got to stop, he says. Stop it. You can't hold on to faith in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ who came to die for sinners and then separate sinners into categories and treat them differently. It's wrong. It's got to stop. God didn't pick Israel based on externals, Deuteronomy 7. He chose Israel because he chose Israel. He chose them because there was nothing special about them and he was going to make something special out of them. That's God's grace. God didn't choose David because there was something better about him. God says man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the, the heart. God's more concerned about the insides than the outsides. Oh, that we would be like him. So this is the exhortation. Having started with that, he drives the point home with an illustration that's very convicting in verse 2 and 3. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. The word if there is a third-class condition in the Greek language. It's hypothetical. He's not saying this actually happened. Back in chapter 1 and verse 26, when he said the word if there, he was talking about something that actually happens. This is a real, this is something that's true. You could be translating that sense. But this is if. Let me throw out a hypothetical situation to you, all right, so I can drive this point home that we struggle with partiality. You're sitting there in church one day, and this guy comes walking in, and he is obviously wealthy. And right behind him comes a guy who looks like a disaster. What's your initial thoughts? How do you treat them? The word assembly, by the way, is a Greek word for synagogue. The synagogue sprang up during that intertestamental period from about 400 B.C. to the time of Christ. Synagogue sprung up because the people of the Israel were scattered all over and things, and they couldn't always get to the temple, so they, they came and formed in these groups for prayer. The synagogue was used primarily for two things. It was either worship and prayer, or it was the place where the elders of the synagogue gathered together to make judgment on problems that occurred between the members. It was their form of a court system. You think about that in 1 Corinthians 6, where it talks about Christian not taking Christian to a secular court. Why don't you go and let the church decide that? It's the same concept. So the leaders of the church should be able to judge righteously between the members of the church. And so some people believe that that's what this text is talking about, that there was a wealthy man and a poor man in the church and they come to resolve their differences and James is saying, why in the world are you instantly giving preference to the rich man? That's possibly. Or it's referring to the gathering of believers, which I lean toward that interpretation, that it's just a worship service and you come in and you see these two new people. Why do you think they're new? Well, because they're looking for a seat, right? 
when, other than now with the weird seating, every time you used to come to church, you came to the exact same seat. I know where you guys sit. You sit in the same seat every single time. I know it. There's like three or four of you that move around once in a while just to confuse people. But everybody else sits in the same seat. And in walk these two guys, and all they know is the way they're dressed, that they're different, and the one guy gets deference over the other. We don't know if they're unbelieving visitors or possibly, most interpreters think, they're new Christians looking for a place to fellowship. So they walk into the church. Maybe they know some friends who go there. Who knows? But they don't appear to have anything else in common other than the fact that they want to be there. That's it. Everything else looks different. And before we blame what happens on the ushers, (laughs) the word you there is plural. Y'all. Y'all are involved in this. Every last one of you. Every last one of you noticed them walk in and you judged and you thought about which one you wanted to sit next to you and which one you didn't. This is what happens. It's a reality. Two people. The first man's rich. I love the word that's used. It says there that he had gold rings on it, had a gold ring. It literally means he's gold-fingered. Gold-finger. So here this guy, Mr. Goldfinger, walks in, and, and most commentators think he had multiple gold rings on each finger ostentatiously declaring how wealthy he was. This guy's got gold and fine clothes. The word there for fine is shining, glorious clothes. It's like the the same word was used of the angel in Acts 10 that appeared to Cornelius and appeared to him in in these bright, shining, glorious clothing and, and spoke to Cornelius. It's just a glorious, bright, clean. No launderer could get it that clean. This guy obviously has got money. The light of the church would be reflecting off of him and just like a disco ball. But the second man's poor. James uses a word there for poor that refers to somebody who is unbelievably poor with very few possessions but not yet reduced to begging. They're poor, but not a beggar. This is a guy who probably works really hard. And if they would have thought about it, the reason he's in those shabby, dirty clothes, the word there is filthy, is because he's worked in them all week. Maybe it's the only outfit he owns. He's filthy from working. And he walks in and they judge him. This guy's rich, this guy's poor, this guy gets honor, this guy, get off to the side. How sad. The context of the first century church even makes this different because in the Greek and Roman cultures at that time, there was really no middle class. So you either are wealthy or you're poor. Now, up to this point in verse 2, everything's good. Do you realize that Jesus would be happy right now because the rich man came in and the poor man came in and Jesus wants both in his church? Do you realize that Jesus died for all classes of people, all nationalities of people, genders, you name it? Jesus died for all classes. And Jesus rejoices when there's a rich man there, like a Joseph of Arimathea. And Jesus rejoices when there's a poor man there. And and now in America, he rejoices when the in-between is there too. Amen? Then why aren't we like him? Why would we do this? In Luke 4, Jesus quoting from Isaiah 61 in the synagogue in Nazareth says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's what Jesus does. What does the church do? Verse 3. You pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. You say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. 
The, the critical word here is pay special attention to. This is a Greek word that implies you gawk, you stare, you are, you are just uh, absorbed with, you fix your gaze upon, and you have, per, you have special favor on the one wearing the fine clothes. So the guy walks in, and everybody in the church is just staring at this guy like, oh, look who just came to church. Wow, that's something. They're excited. Now, I remember early on in our ministry at Shepherd's Community Church, and we, we, lived, we met in a little elementary school. It was hard to find uh, back in some back streets. And I got a call one week from a guy who called me, and he said, hey, Pastor Paul, I'm a friend of so-and-so who knows you, and he recommended I should come to your church. I said, okay, that's great, and he told me his name. And so on Sunday, we chatted for a while on the phone. I had no idea who he was. He, uh, the church service started. He couldn't find the place. It was a few minutes late. He walks and sits in the very back seats of the church, and and we used to greet our visitors, and we would have our visitors all stand up, and we'd ask them what their name was and who they knew, and we would say, yay, thanks for coming. And so I said, uh, and by the way, we have a visitor here today. His name is, and I heard an audible gasp in the church. Like, <gasps> and everybody turned and looked at him. And I'm like, what's the deal? Well, I didn't know he was an actor on a very famous television program. And everybody, all of a sudden, wanted to be his friend. How sad. Over the years, as we've met people like that, it's been neat to have them say what they've appreciated is going to churches where they're treated the same as everyone else. I see something like that happening in this illustration. The rich man walks in, people start whispering to one another with delight. The poor man walks in, they whisper with one another with disdain. To the rich man, you sit here in a good place. Now in the synagogues back then, there were very few seats that were actual seats. They were places of honor. There were benches around the outside, and then there was like a little lip down below that was like a footstool. And so what they said to the rich guy was, hey, uh, you go sit in one of the places of honor. You can sit up there right by where the scrolls are kept, where, the, where they, they bring the scrolls or they read the word to us. You, can, you go sit up there. And then he said, hey, you just go stand somewhere to the poor guy or maybe sit at my footstool. To the rich guy, we want you in a prominent position where we can all gawk at you. To the poor guy, just get out of my vision or sit down below so I don't have to deal with you. What a grievous picture. What a horrible picture. I'm not giving up my seat for someone like you. I remember when I came to candidate here at this church in August of 2007, we were going to consider merging two churches together. It looked great. Came to the first time to come preach here so the congregation could get to know me. And some dear friends of our church came with us. And they went and they sat down. And right before the service started, a couple walked in and said, You're in our seats. And our friends were gracious enough to say, oh, we're sorry. And they got up and moved. When they told me about that later, I almost called the merger off. But then I thought, you know what? This is instruction we all need because we all struggle with this to one degree or another. How sad in the church of Jesus Christ, blood-bought, by God's grace, we would dare treat anybody as less than based on externals. It's wrong. And again, it's plural. And you say to the poor man, y'all, you may not have said it out loud, but you thought it. What a sad thing. I'm happy to report that in the recent years, what I've heard repeatedly from visitors to this church is, wow, your people are so gracious, so welcoming, made me feel so special. Oh, what a blessing to hear that. Well, James could have given other illustrations. He could have talked about the people we invite out to lunch after church. He could have talked about the people we invite over to our homes, the people we choose for positions of leadership in the church. But he chose a real obvious one that everybody would be convicted by. 
based on standing. So we have exhortation, illustration, now the application, verse 4. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now, what an example of earthly wisdom. I want the rich guy because I want something out of him. That's not heavenly wisdom. God doesn't need anything from us, does he? God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Everything in the earth and the heavens is his. He doesn't need rich people in the church. He's glad to have them. He's glad to have rich or poor. He doesn't need their money. He doesn't need their skills. He doesn't need any of us. He could do this without us, but he chooses to do it through us. And he wants us to walk in heavenly wisdom. He says there's two more things about this personal favoritism that's just wrong. The one is you make distinctions among yourself. The word means to divide and to decide. You mark one out as one thing and one out as the other. You made a decision in your mind, you're judge, jury, and you've convicted and made up your mind on that. The same Greek word is used in chapter 1, verse 6 of the double-minded man who doubts. There's a doubting going on. There's a tearing apart of the mind of what's going on. What should be going on is the Word of God saying that they're all image bearers and should be treated equally. But that's not going on. He decides differently from God, which is why he's an unstable man. In chapter 2, it refers to the fact that he's decided that rich people are better than poor. One's better, one's worse. One is superior, one is inferior. Does this sound similar to what's going on in our culture? What are people in America sick and tired of? Being told you're inferior based on the color of your skin. That's wicked, it's evil, it's sin, and James would denounce it here. It should never happen in the church. One is worth more to you than the other one. Then he says you become judges with evil motives, and the evil motives there refers to thoughts or dialogues going on inside your own head. Dialogues that lead to evil decisions. And I can imagine what's going on. This is based on outwards opinion. So let's, let's be positive here. Let's say we're trying to justify this. And what if my motive is I want the rich man to bless our church? I mean, after all, the guy's probably famous. And wouldn't it be cool to go to a church with famous people in it? Would that make us special? Can you imagine the testimony he would be for our church and for Christ? Could you imagine the money he could give to the building program? And by the way, if he's wealthy, he's blessed by God. He's clearly got skills. He could use those skills to help us administrate our church better. It's a win-win. Or maybe you're thinking of what he could do for you. I sure hope he invites me out to lunch. I sure hope he invites me to his house. I sure hope I become his best friend. I sure hope he adopts me. Judges with evil motives. How do you know the rich man is rich? What if it's fake? Back in those days, they had places you could go rent fancy clothing and jewelry to appear like you were something. What if he's a con artist coming to fleece the flock? What if he acquired it through immoral business dealings? What if he loses it all next week in a stock market crash? Are you going to see him the same way? If your answer is no, you're guilty. What about the poor man? What are you saying about him? Are you saying he's of no value to the church? Are you saying that he may not have some skills? How do you know he's really poor or why he's poor? Maybe he just lost it because his company got shut down in the pandemic. Maybe he's on the rebound. Maybe he's going to be wealthy next year. Why are we judging this way? It's so superficial. What if he gives most of his income away to ministry and that's why he's got so little for himself? One man said, money still talks far too loudly in Christian circles. When and where it does, the glory of Christ will eventually depart. My only question I ask myself is, am I that shallow? Would Jesus make these judgments? Does he think poor people are a waste of time? Clearly not. Here's the problem. They took their eyes off faith in their glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And they fixed their eyes on earthly things and put their faith in a man. How sad. How sad. 
The sin of partiality and prejudice is the issue here. It's not rich and poor. This is simply an illustration. This is not the point. It is a point. It's a reality. It's an obvious problem. But the point is, are we impartial? Are we demonstrating personal favoritism? Are we practicing worldly wisdom? If so, we've got to change the way we think. We have to reason differently inside of our heads. We have to see people the way God sees people and value them accordingly. And if we do, we'll become like him. God's main concern is you're either a believer or an unbeliever. He wants to change the heart. He doesn't care if you're a rich believer or a poor believer. He doesn't, that's, not, that's not the issue. And we need to see people the way he sees them and reach out to them and love them for the glory of Christ. It's more blessed to give than to receive. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, be the servant, slave of all. If you only give to those who give back, even sinful unbelievers do that. Oh, friends, we succumb to worldly wisdom. Racism, socioeconomic status, education, baby boomer versus generation X versus millennial. I want to go to a church that's young and hip and cool. I don't want them old people around. I want to go to church that's old and wise. I don't want them young punks around. You're a racist. You are, you, you've got serious partiality issues in your head. The church is multi-generational and should always be. Do I get an amen? It ought to be older instructing younger, but you can't do that if we all separate. The church is the believers coming together. And by the way, James could have used the illustration. He said a Republican walked in and a Democrat walked in. Do you understand that people who come here, if they come to faith in Christ, will meet them where they are and work with them? We don't judge them based on these externals. We help them learn and grow. What did Jesus do? <laughs> this is funny. He called zealots and tax collectors to be together as his disciples. What amazing thing is that? Imagine what the grace of God can do to change all the externals and make them one. I love the Lord, don't you? I wanna be like him. I want our church to represent him. The world right now, this is the issue. Partiality, you can call it a number of other things. Personal favoritism, call it whatever you want. This is the issue that's irritating the life out of people. And they ought to come to this church and find out there's a no partiality zone here. We love you no matter what. We will reach out to you. We're not here for what we can get from you. We're here to give to you. Join us and help us do that with more. That's what we're about. That's the church. We're not a country club for rich people who, who focus on externals. We're a rescue place. We're a hospital for the hurting of the world who needs salvation. And the answer to the world's problems is the gospel and the church. The gospel and the church. Can't we put that on display? Think about this week, this reproof. Are you guilty in any degree? I'm not talking about everybody else around you. Is this something that James would say, repent? Change your way of thinking. Stop it. Ask the Lord to reveal that to you. Come back next time and we'll look at why, the reasons behind why this must happen if we're going to be a church that the Lord Jesus looks upon and smiles. Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us with an unconditional love. We can look around this room, and as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, there's not many mighty, there's not many noble, there's not a whole lot of rich. We're just normal people here. We've been saved by grace. And we come to you together as those, we're male and female, we're old and young, we're different nations, different language groups, different everything, but we share one thing in common, and that's you. Oh, thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for making us brethren. Cause us to act like it. Cause our theology to impact the way we live. And make this place a testimony to the nation of what it's like when Jesus is the answer. We ask for his glory. Amen.